Hello, you're tuned to Pregnancy, Birth and Beyond, contemporary conversations where stories, science, traditions and new ideas meet. Pregnancy, Birth and Beyond. It's about family, connected parenting, celebrating your amazing body, connection with your community and finding your truth. Our show is coming to you from the studios of Bay FM in Byron Bay and is broadcasting across Australia on the Community Radio Network and globally via our podcast at pbbmedia.org. This episode is sponsored by Mugu Skincare. Thanks for tuning in to Pregnancy, Birth and Beyond. I would like to personally pay my respects to the oracle people of the Bundjalung Nation, of where me, this building and our conversation will be happening today. I'd like to pay my respects to the Indigenous people of this country and thank them as well as Elders past, present and emerging for taking delicate and complex care of this land and all those who live on it for at least 60,000 years. I acknowledge that though I have the privilege of these feelings of gratitude, yesterday and today is a day of mourning and grief for many. Zenith Virago, our guest for today, is a a warm woman, she is, understanding the nuances of humanity and the basic need for people to mark important times in their lives with sacredness. Zenith serves those embarking into and travelling through birth, marriage and death. Highly respected for her guidance and presence in the Byron Shire and beyond, Zenith is a jewel, a wealth of embodied knowledge and deep reverence for the human experience. Zenith is the founder, EO and Death Walker trainer for the Natural Death Care Centre, a Byron Bay based charity. Zenith is also the creator of the Vagina Conversations, a performance of local women expressing empowered vagina stories, with the next Vagina Conversations coming up soon right here at the Byron Theatre. I look forward to speaking with Zenith about the relationships between birth and death. With one of her roles as a death walker, Zenith is attuned to the transition between living in this physical body and the other side, whatever you perceive that to be. Welcome and I just can't wait to have this conversation. I admire your trajectory and just you as a person with so much experience. You've written on your website, whether it is birth, marriage or death, all these amazing life events are interwoven by a colourful common thread, love. And love is in capital letters. Tell us what you have noticed in the reminder of love in the transition through death. Well, I think with uh, with ceremony, most of those ceremonies are celebrating love. And really, for many years, I only worked if people loved loved someone enough to get married. They loved someone enough to create life. And they loved someone enough to mark their death. Or they loved themselves enough to come and see me when they were dying. Mm. So I felt like my whole body of work was founded in love. Love was the sort of blood Mm. that flowed through them all. And I see, having just had the experience of a dear friend dying last year, really got to see and feel how those experiences can be really expansive. And even though she died suddenly and quite shockingly, most of us expanded into love. Mm. A couple of people contracted into fear. But in that expansion, it really, it was such an incredible gift. And for her partner, who had you know great support, great guidance, mm. and I just saw her travel that journey the very best it could be. So I've spent 25 years in that work wanting people to have great ceremony, to die well, Mm. and to have healthy bereavement. And it was such a gift in that experience to see see her partner in that healthy bereavement. So even with a shocking sudden death, that within about four months, you know, the shock had dissolved and she'd settled into that. And it was was just really an incredible experience to share that journey. Mm with someone and see that everything I believe, everything that I've been teaching to other people absolutely works Mm. and absolutely is the culmination of all that learning. And it's great support in a time when it's challenging, Mm. whatever that might be. Mm. I know that you're a woman that understands the power of words in creating our social attitudes and I really enjoy the words that you so intentionally choose when you speak. 
You've chosen to call yourself in one of your roles a death walker. And what was your decision-making process behind the description of, of what you do, taking people through death? Well, when I first started this work here 25 or more years ago in Byron, I was just busy minding my own business <laughs> and having a great life. But um, death offered itself to me as an experience. And so part of my way of being in the world is to say yes to whatever offers itself unless I get a big physical body no. So great boundaries. Mm. And I find my body, my nervous system, my awareness generally looks out for me. Mm. And it saved me from a lot of things. When I first started, people wanted to tag the name, oh, you're like a midwife to the dying. Doula wasn't a word in common usage then. So no one said that, but everybody said, oh, you're a death midwife. And I, with full respect, and as a mother, and with full respect to midwife, said, no, no, I don't, I, I didn't feel that that was the right tag for me. Mm. Because as midwives, people are dealing, with, you know, they're aiming for life, but they suddenly get death mm. sometimes. Whereas I'm only looking at death. And it that's a much easier mm. experience. And really the... You know, the mother delivers the baby. The midwife accompanies her and supports her along with the doula or any, and, the, and the partner and the friends and family. But the mother is delivering the baby, not, not the midwife. Mm. And so when I started to work with dying people, I, you know, they're dying. I'm not having that experience. Mm. And so even as a woman for birth, I know what it is like to to deliver a baby but I don't know what it's like to be dying Mm. and so I really felt that what I'm doing is accompanying them or walking with them Mm. so I'm walking with the person who's dying and I'm accompanying the family or friends of that person in their journey with that person and then after their death occurs into their bereavement Mm. into ceremony and into their loss and Mm. into their bereavement. Another question on language. Do you see habitual language systems perpetuating attitudes that disconnect people from the humanness of death? For instance, I know that for a long time you have not used the word suicide and you steer away from the term grief. Uh, Can you enlighten us on your consciousness around these kind of language choices? Yeah, so I just feel that people... Media in particular, but lots of people follow what happens in media, is that the term grief has become a blanket term. So like a big, heavy, grey blanket that people put over the families or the person themselves who's dying. But what that doesn't allow for is an appreciation of the intricacy of the emotions that people are actually feeling. Mm. So under that grief blanket or that grief umbrella, what I see is a range of different emotions. So some people are very relieved that that person has died because their suffering is over. That might be the suffering of the dying person or the suffering of the accompanying people. Some people are sad, some people are shocked, some people are surprised, some people are traumatized. Some people are angry. Some people are just sad. Mm. Some people miss them in their lives. Some people are full of regret um, uh, that things were as they were. So this is, and and if you just, if we just blanket it all with grief, we don't get to sort of articulate the fineness of of what we're feeling, and then be able to appreciate that and then work with that Mm. or let it go. So, you know, there's so many incredible things when someone dies. You know, they're great gifts in death. Mm. Some people are sad because they're losing a future together Mm. and and things that could have been. Like when people say they died too soon. Mm. So I would say that's just... A matter of opinion. I mean, people can't really die too soon. They die when they die. If you take that attitude to it, and it's a perfectly understandable attitude when people are hurting and they love someone, but it's not conducive to healing Mm. because you're sort of stuck in this attitude that it's unfair, that it's too soon, and they had so much more to give. All of those things may well be, but they 
they do not help people in their healing journey. The phrase commit suicide, so I've dissolved that out of my language for about the last 12 years. And the reason why is because it comes from when suicide was a crime. Mm. So, And the whole body of language around that failure and success. So if you were successful when you tried to kill yourself, then you succeeded and you were dead. But if you failed to achieve what you wanted to accomplish and to kill yourself, then you would be arrested mm. and tried and sometimes put in prison mm. because you had committed the crime of suicide, like you commit the crime of homicide, mm. genocide, infanticide. So when people use that phrase, they're perpetuating a concept and a system that thinks it's immoral that people can kill themselves. Mm. And some people are fighting for you know, assisted dying, but don't, don't think people who are mm. not dying shouldn't be able to kill mm. themselves. So as a celebrant, I've had to stand at those ceremonies, and sometimes it's very young people. So I'm very careful about the language I use so that it, it offers them either a neutrality or it's something that will support them to be able to go on into their lives without that person physically in them. So what I'm trying not to do is dig a deeper mm. hole, and that's particularly relevant when it's a small baby mm. who's died. Mm. Such deep and complex issues mm. that only someone with a long experience in these realms can offer. Zenith, I notice there are so many social complexities around the transition from life into death. Does an unwillingness to understand these complexities feed this common fear of death? And through your experience, what do you witness as the why in the collective fear of death? Which could be a huge question, but I'm asking it. That's right. It's a huge question. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what I would say in response, whether it'll be the answer that question, but just it is that my, a lot of people are unfamiliar and when you, it's a bit like grief when someone says I'm afraid of dying or death then you need to unpack that and s ask them what part of death are they afraid of and having done that many times with many different people, people who are well people who are ill, people who are dying, what you generally find under their is you know a fineness, and sometimes it's about leaving their children. Sometimes it's about uh, the fear of the unknown. Sometimes it's about pain, but often the underlying thread between all those ideas is about control. Is about being out of control, mm. and that the situation that they find themselves in is out of their control. So they can c choose what uh, treatment options they're going to take. And that can be very confusing, especially in this area where people are full of wonderful advice but also of alternative options and having watched a range of people do a range of different things and just, you know, whatever gets you there. And only those people can make those decisions when they're in that situation. Mm. And we were talking before and really... Yeah, you've just got to be this supportive to people because it's a very freaky and scary experience to be diagnosed with a disease that may kill you or be family or friends of someone who's taken their own life, who's mm. killed themselves or who has died through natural causes by a heart attack or something like that. So I think it's really about, again, unpacking that statement and, and that's for each person to do. Mm. And that's a really great... You know, if you're a meditator, then meditate on that. How would that be for me if I was diagnosed with a disease? How would it be if someone I love mm. has that? How would it be if that person died suddenly? How would it be if I died suddenly? What unfinished business would I have? Mm. What can I do now while I'm alive that will make a difference to people if I should die suddenly? So instead of looking away, looking into... Looking in, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and unpacking, unpacking it. This episode is sponsored by Mugu Skincare. Developed by the founders for their own children, Mugu is made for issues such as cradle cap, nappy rash and eczema. Their sunscreens and washes are gentle for babies and children, using only the sort of ingredients you would use if you had the time to make them. 
Mugu is stocked in most pharmacies and health shops around Australia and they ship overseas. Check out their wide range of affordable products that even include deodorant, dental care and vegan makeup at mugu.com.au. Always read the label, use as directed. And for a limited time, our listeners can get a 15% discount on online purchases by quoting the one word code PBB podcast. That's one word, PBB podcast. I can see some parallels between the journeys of birth and death. Obviously, there are many, many reasons why expecting mothers do not want to think or look into death during a time of bringing in life. But through your experience, what do you see as a healthy attitude towards death, bringing every person closer to the zest of life, no matter how close they are to death or life? Or I think the best thing we can all do, so not particularly f- for pregnant mothers, but is to set a place for death at our table. So to appreciate that it can occur at any moment to any to ourselves and to anyone that we love. So you, you set a place for it in your realm of possibilities, but you don't feed it. So you don't become anxious, you don't worry about it, you don't, you know, sort of super protective. You just know that it's a possibility and then you carry on. And what I see in the training that I deliver for people who come and do that, what it means is they develop and experience a much deeper familiarity and they're much more confident in their ability to discuss with people those feelings so that if someone does die they are um, they're like last aiders mm. they're like ready to be able to speak to that person when everyone else is spinning out or just fussing anybody with a familiarity whether that's on a personal or professional level or a community level will be able to sort of walk with that person and and support them mm. in a solid, kind, you know, supportive way, whatever that looks like. And so familiarity is one of one of the things that we can develop. You don't have to be at people's bedsides. You just have to be able to, again, go in and start to explore that within ourselves. And so normally in a class I will ask who's feeling okay about dying, and a lot of older people will put their hands up and then I just say, okay, out of those, who feels okay about their children dying? Mm. And there are very few times that there's any hands left up because that is a very confronting ex- And it's, it's our biggest love is our children. And so most people, when they think about that, it will be very distressing and they will turn away from that. Mm. So... To meditate on that or to think about it, to have one cup of tea a day or one cup of coffee mm-hmm. and think about that, and you're not bringing it on, but if that happens to a friend of yours, you will have something that will sustain you mm. in that ability to be great support to them. Mm. Mm. And it's beautiful to frame that not just for yourself, but it's for others around you that you mm. would build that familiarity. Mm. It's very helpful. Because everyone holds their breath when someone mm. is birthing, that both uh, both people are going to be well and alive mm. after that birth. We take that as a given now, but in many countries that's not the case. And mm. in here, th- it's not the case sometimes. Mm. It? But we've got the best possible conditions to, to stop that happening. Mm. But somewhere in us, there's always mm. a, a small concern for that eventuality mm. and that was treaty by Yothu Yindi in the break we just we just happened to start talking about tears and how in different tears from different emotions are the shapes of different molecules and I love the poetry of that zenith and probably experience a lot of tears in your career is it always a joy to witness someone's emotions I wouldn't say it's always a joy Maybe because sometimes it's words. very painful to watch someone you know who's lost, especially children, partners. 
but what I do think is really important for people to understand is that so when we feel those emotions, our body creates you know chemicals inside us, and when we cry, we are, whatever emotion we those tears are generated from, we're crying those chemicals out. Mm. So for people who don't cry, who swallow that back down, they are not getting rid of their chemicals. So they're staying. Some so tears of joy. If you don't cry them, that's sort of fine. You're just full of joy. But tears of um, anger or humiliation or inability to process your emotions are all staying inside, and that has a toxic build up. Mm. And it, it, it's not rocket science to see that that can move towards disease mm. and that can move towards anger and rage if you're full of a toxic substance mm. by your own creation. Mm. Unblock those tear ducts. Um, so, I mean, something I've been thinking about, but after the recent fire crisis and with this climate crisis that we all find ourselves living in, do you as a death walker see the opportunity for greater compassion emotional literacy and healing around more understanding of the death process or the birth, death and regeneration cycle? I think so, but right now people are very busy staying alive and I think it's running parallel to the situation and the biggest, fortunately, we haven't had a great loss of life. We've only had, in the big scheme of those fires, we've had a minimal loss of human life. Mm. But we have had massive, massive loss of animals and especially native animals for Australians. And I think that at the moment, um, lots of people's uh, grief and all the feelings that are under that blanket (laughs) for the sake of this conversation Mm -hmm. are directed uh, towards the loss of the animals and we saw it mm. when the three uh, firefighters were killed the other the previous firefighters who've been killed but then the last three mm-hmm. um, in the a- aeroplane where you know there's I, I heard it on the news and they just kept saying it over and over again um, whereas normally each news bulletin the news gets bumped by mm. what's happened. And I would say that's because, you know, the whole country is traumatised mm. by the fires and the loss of life and particularly the loss of animals mm. and, and then the loss of property and, you know, seeing people on the beach, the air quality in lots of towns. I mean, we're, we've got off pretty scot-free, really, mm. the big scheme of things. But... It's very when you speak to people who have come from Melbourne or Sydney or elsewhere, you can you can feel in them. That it's like they've been in a war zone. They are in a war zone. Mm. It is a war. Mm. Yeah. And speaking about beauty and beauty in painful moments, are there some standout moments of beauty that you've had in your career, so walking beside people in either marriage, birth, or death? that you'd like to share with us? I think I think one of the most useful is is what I've... So I've seen more men cry in my professional life than most people, I think, would ever see in a lifetime. And a lot of those are men who are marrying their, their partners, men and women, um, who were crying tears of love, of adoration of joy, of um, incredible gratitude for their life and that person in their life. And and what ceremony does is it offers you a set of once-only emotions. Mm. So around marriage, yeah, I've seen so much. It's been such an incredible journey. But because of that, I saw that most men come from a place of honour. That's part of their core, the core of the masculine. Women have it too. But so at funerals, when people are having to get up to speak, so most women won't worry if they're going to cry. They mm. won't say, I'm not getting up because I'm going to cry. That it's something else that will impede them from getting up. But if they do get up and they cry, they just carry on. Mm. Yeah. But a lot of men won't get up because they're afraid of crying in public, because they're emotional and their love for that person 
is is controlling their emotional response to that. And but what I do know is that if that person is particularly close to them and they do not get up out of their seat at the funeral mm. ceremony to speak, they are going to regret that. Mm. Rightly or wrongly, they're going to feel like I was a man enough mm. to speak at my mother's funeral. So I think one of the most courageous things a man can do is to get up and cry whilst declaring their love for someone mm. and not give a shit mm. and not be concerned about what that means. Because we all know that when men cry, it triggers everybody. Mm. And it's a moment of hope, actually, for the world when men are... And these are sweeping generalizations, mm -hmm. but this is my personal experience from all of those years of working at, at that intimate level with people. And what I see afterwards is the incredible sense of honor and respect that those men in particular have when they accomplish what they set out to do. It doesn't mm. matter whether they cry. And I just saw my youngest son do it at, at the funeral where he held, he spoke and he held himself because it was so important for him to say what he wanted to say. Mm. And a lot of the old men came up to him afterwards and was so um, complimentary to him for being able to articulate all of that and feel it fully. But it's a liberation for others because w whatever makes you cry those emotions out, and that's part of my job as a celebrant in those ceremonies is to do that because th that allows you to move on to the next stage mm. of that experience, whatever that might be in that particular circumstances around that loss. Mm. Thank you. Greater literacy around the emotional nuances in the death transition can just create more for everyone and greater compassion. And speaking of compassion, I know that you're inspired, Zenith, by this quote from the Dalai Lama. My religion is simple. My religion is kindness. How do you think kindness creates connection through both joyous and challenging rites of passage? I suppose because we all know what kindness feels like. We know when someone does something kind to us or we do something kind for someone else. We can feel it. So, f again, around language, I don't usually work with compassion. I work with kindness because I know what that feels like. And it started probably... I married a couple, Kaz and Ken, who many people will know in Brunswick Heads and Mullumbimby. And one of their vows in their marriage ceremony was, I promise to look after you when you're not feeling well. And it was just such a simple... But everybody, all their friends went, oh, because we all knew what that felt like mm. rather than these promise, you know, grand or promises that mean something, but you can't feel them mm. always. And so I, I just find kindness is a very tangible thing. And I often find myself saying to people, oh, that's so kind, thank you, to acknowledge it, that it's their action, but also that I can feel it. I just love it. So it's very, it's, and I just generally think, what is the kind thing to do here? If I'm in any doubt, normally I'm not in doubt what mm. to do. I'm, I'm sort of good with that. Mm. But if I am in doubt, I think, what's the kind thing to do? And then I do it. I know that you have a poem for us there. And b before you read that poem, where can we find you, Zenith? And I mean, how can we find out more about you? Do you have a website or where's the best so place? So I work out of a charity called the Natural Death Care Centre, which is easy to find. It's mm -hmm. .org, but um, it's, that's worth a Google. And on Facebook, um, I'm easy to find. I'm easy to find walking down the street. I'm easy <laughs> to find at the beach or the farmer's market. And that's the great thing about working in community, mm. that it's made for our community, it's made ve death very accessible. Mm. Also because I'm very social. So mm. people <laughs> don't have to make an appointment. They don't have to come to an office. They can just stop me in the street and say, hey, this has just happened. Can I talk to you about that? Mm, I can vouch for that because my phone broke when I was meant to have a phone meeting with Zenith and 
And the next time we called, she was just around the corner, so she popped into the bakery for a coffee, and that was much nicer to be in person. Yeah. yeah. So, and, you know, it's just easy mm. living here and doing death and uh, everything. Mm. It's easy here. So shall I begin? Sure. So this is called The Contemplation of No Coming and No Going, and it's by Thich Nhat Hanh. And if you are in a situation where you can close your eyes to listen to it, then I would encourage you, but obviously not if that is a dangerous situation for you. (laughs) This body is not me. I am not limited by this body. I am life without boundaries. I have never been born and I have never died. Look at the oceans and the sky filled with stars, manifestations from my wondrous true mind. Since before time, we hope you've enjoyed this episode of Pregnancy, Birth, Birth and Beyond. And Death. Tune in next week for more information and inspiration, bringing us full circle. On our journey. Birth and Death. You can find our show on iTunes, Spreaker, the usual social media under Pregnancy, Birth and Beyond, and our website at pbbmedia.org. We will meet today. We will meet again tomorrow. We will meet at the source of every moment. We meet each other in all forms of life. Hmm. And if you miss that, that poem was called The Contemplation of No Coming and No Going. And if you'd like, thank you so much for sharing with us your experiential wisdom. It's changed me and I'm sure a lot of our listeners' attitudes towards death and just living, really. Yeah.